The, the U.S. and China both want to avoid a Cold War. They want to avoid serious conflict. And we saw that with the way that uh, Hillary Clinton worked with her Chinese interlocutors to, uh, to try to smooth over what was potentially a very nasty little crisis over Mr. Chen, uh, the human rights dissident who we ended up getting uh, to New York, as a matter of fact. Um, but, but the problem is that these countries are structurally aimed at each other, right? I mean, uh, China is growing. It is going to take the mantle as the largest economy from the United States. When the U.S. took the mantle from Britain, it wasn't such a big deal because we frankly agree on most stuff. U.S. and China don't. Um, and so I think what we need to do um, is we need to try very hard not only to manage conflicts where they exist, but to accept that we have conflicts, right? One of the dangers is that if you pretend that conflicts aren't there and you put them underneath the bed, they fester, they get worse and people get antagonized. We need to both, we need to understand the Chinese perspective. We need to particularly understand it and talk about it when it's, when it's radically different from that in the United States. It's gonna happen on a bunch of issues, cyber. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen on security issues. It's gonna happen in the Middle East. It's gonna happen on state capitalism. It's gonna happen in the Arctic and fights over the resources there. To the extent that we are not prepared to really accept that there are fundamental differences, some of them will be immutable between the U.S. and China. We will not be able to manage them effectively. We will also not be able to ring fence them away from areas where, frankly, there is a lot of mutuality in the relationship. I really think that honesty is the best measure, and, and, and we don't have enough of that between our two countries. We have a lot of mistrust. It makes it worse. Uh, the way we incentivize governments to be more accountable for global issues um, is by making the fora that they engage on issues more manageable. A G20 doesn't work. There are too many countries. They don't agree on anything. How many climate summits do we need to have, global climate summits, before we understand that we are banging our heads against a wall and it's not going to work? How many times do we need to do Cancun? and Durban and Copenhagen before we stop. We should, climate is getting, getting sufficiently challenging. We owe it to ourselves to be realistic that global summits won't work. We need, as Americans, to find a smaller group of like-minded countries that we can do something with. I know climate is a global challenge. It deserves a global response. You know what? It's not going to get a global response. So instead of doing nothing and pretending that we're going to address it globally, Let's do something. And maybe that something will be mitigation. Maybe it'll be adaptation. If we wait too long, it's going to be geoengineering, but it'll be something. We need to start to address this. We're doing this on trade. We're starting to with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We would do more of it if we did it with the Europeans and had a transatlantic partnership as well. The Europeans would like that. The Americans, not yet. We need to get there. We could do that on monetary policy. We do it on financial regulation because you look at Basel III and you already have a smaller group of like-minded countries. They're the major central banks of the developed world. But the other things that are happening in the world right now still have too much old global architecture that doesn't work. We're not going to get accountability until we jettison that. And we understand that we're going to have coalitions of the willing, not just on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but on climate and trade and monetary policy and cyber and economic statecraft and all the rest. That's where we need to go.